In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for that powerful name. The Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He that overcometh, overcometh in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the presence of your spirit that is here tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God can give strength right now to those that are weak. Hallelujah. God can breathe. Amen. A fresh, new desire to overcome in all of us tonight. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. God has so much more for us. Let me say that again. God has so much more for us. The thought that's going through my mind right now, I've shared it before, but it's kind of like a watermark. If you ever had a fish tank, water evaporates and that water mark on the fish tank you know that you got to refill it because you can see the the line the water mark where the water used to be right you can go to Lake Winnebago you can see the the waves crashing into the into the shore you can see where the water marks are where the water was right too often we get accustomed to the spirit of God and the power of God in our lives and we go so far right we only go so far and and the spirit of God is moving on a Sunday or a Wednesday and well God's brought us to this point spiritually before and we're comfortable right where that that mark or that level or wherever that commitment is in that spiritual mark in our lives I'll say it again God has way more for you and I and I don't know what it's going to take amen I I don't know what it's going to take uh, but I believe that when we make up our mind to get what we need to get from God. Now, again, I, I understand that, you know, the water, you know, the, in the scripture, the story about how the, in that pool, you know, when, when the water was moving, if they didn't jump in to get their healing. Now, I know that that was a, a particular situation, but family camp is starting, right? I mean, goodness gracious, some of you could get your miracle next week, but, but we know even though that is true, we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for family camp, right? Amen. Amen. We do have to, we do have to figure out, we do have to figure out what we have to do as a person, as a child of God, what we have to do to get ourselves to the place that, that we're hungry for it. You know, that, that we want it right? That we want the move of God in our life more now than we did yesterday, right? Amen? I remember when I was uh, dieting, it seems like I do that a lot, um, but I would have a hankering for, for a Snicker bar or something. Uh, I don't know what my favorite candy bar is. Uh, I do like Snicker bars. Uh, I do like Babe Ruth. I like things with peanuts in it. Um, but you know what I would do is I would give up a meal. And I would eat two Snicker bars. <laughs> and you know what? It didn't, it didn't sabotage my diet. It just 
I gave up that meal for something I wanted, you know? And if I stuck to it, it would be okay. It's when you, you know, it's when you take the plunge, you know? And you, and you, and you eat not just those two candy bars, but uh, you wake up in the morning, then you're going to have, you know, uh, you're going to have the, the bacon and the sausage and the ham and, uh, and the cinnamon roll, you know? Uh, you're going to, you're going to, you're just going to have it all, right? And you just give up, you know, but when we get hungry for the things of God and we make a decision that, hey, I want this more than anything in my life, nothing can hold us back from that. Amen. Praise God. We got to just condition ourselves for that. Amen. Praise God. And I hate to say it, but it's true that sometimes difficulty, trials, Persecution, trouble, kind of lead into my message tonight, right? That helps us get to where we need to be in God. Amen. If I could have a little bit more monitor up here on the platform. Amen. We're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. That sounds great. Thank you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. How many of you are enjoying the book of 1 Peter? I am. I am. It has been a blessing to me, and you guys know this, that when a preacher preaches, he's preaching to everyone in the seat, but he's also preaching to himself, and uh, I'm thankful for the Word of God, amen, I'm thankful that, that I, can, I can teach and preach and allow the Word of God to, to speak to my life as well. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, and the scripture says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober in hope. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance but as he which hath called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation why because it is written be holy for I am holy praise God let us together pray and let's just ask God to help us tonight, right? To, to learn from the Word of God. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the Word of God tonight. We thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do tonight. There are men and women that have a hunger and desire to know more about you. People want to eat and consume the Word of God. They want it to become a part of their life. And I pray tonight that those that are hungry, those that are thirsty, will be will be quenched, they will be fed tonight in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would have your perfect will to be done. You know the hearts. You know those that are desperate. You know those that are, are dissatisfied with the watermark, spiritual watermarks in their life. And I pray in Jesus' name to help us to receive the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I do this most often. Amen. Every service, would you be nice to somebody next to you? Even if it's your sister or your mother, amen, be nice to them, amen, shake a hand, bump a fist, tell somebody appreciate them, amen. We're talking about being the body of Christ, praise God, we are to be the body of Christ, as the body says there's many members, but there's one body, many members, but one body, one head, right, and Christ is the head of the body, and you and I are to be fitly joined together, knowing our, our talents, our giftings, our callings, and doing the work of the kingdom. Amen. Being connected to the body, one with another. Amen. Giving glory to God. Let's do a little bit of review tonight. Being a Christian is who we are. I've said it before. It's not something that we do only on the weekend. Being a Christian is not something we put on and take off. It is something that 
that we give our lives to wholeheartedly. If you're a 50% Christian, you're not going to do so well at it. You're not. Even if you're 75 and you guys know where I'm going. I say this, I, I use this, like if I were going to bake you some cookies. Right? And I'm just going to put, I'm just going to put a little bit of dog poop in it. You know, it's just a little bit. I mean, for goodness sakes, you guys, just go ahead and eat the cookies. I mean, come on, right? I mean, that's disgusting. I mean, I don't care how many chocolate chips you put in, but if there's some dog poo-poo there, I mean, I don't want any chocolate. I don't want any of your chocolate chip cookies, okay? And so a Christian that is only 90% Christian, there's going to be something wrong with him. Now, again, you know I can't go down this road, but I understand that there's nobody perfect, okay? But we are to, we are to be as much like Christ as we can, right? You and I need to every single moment crucify this flesh. Now, sometimes our flesh does get the best of us. And the difference between the chosen and those that aren't going to make it are those that get right back into the race, right? I mean, the Bible says those that endure, the same shall be saved, okay? You, you, you might fall or, or fail God, but if you give up and you just quit, well, well, then you, 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 you've told the end of the story for yourself. But if you, the Bible says if you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. It's, it's in, it, what's in your heart. If you have a heart for God, you're going you're gonna to pursue God. You're going you're gonna to give everything you can to it. And, and it's, it's from, the Bible says from glory to glory, from moment to moment, from day to day, we're becoming more and more like him, right? From, 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 from moment to moment. Amen. God's words, that God's word is working on me. Amen. The spirit of God is working in me. Amen. You are working in me. Iron sharpeneth iron. We've got so many blessings, so many things that can help you and I to become more and more like Christ. No matter what we face, it's what Peter was trying to let the first century church know, no matter what you go through, you, you got to stay devoted and committed. You can't predict or foresee the future. But no matter what happens, no matter what hardships, no matter what trouble, no matter what persecution, no matter what might derail you, you've got to trust God. You've got to put your faith in the word of God. And when you do, God will take care of you. God will take care of your future. He will take care of your tomorrows. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose you see when you and i fall in love with god and we do not love anything more than we love him god then will work on our behalf because of our complete commitment and devotion to him you see god takes care of our business when we take care of god's business right when you and i are about his purpose, amen, his purpose becomes defining you and helping you and, and, and maturing you and sometimes chastising you. We'll learn about that here in a little bit. This is why we need to be like the first century church and not waver in our commitments to God. We need to stay focused on being faithful until the very end. First Peter, we've already been through this. 
We're still in review. Wherefore, and it's bad news for you guys. Just bad, just outright bad news for you. Our clock broke. So there is no telling, you know, what's going to, how long tonight's going to go, you know. I mean, it's just, there's nothing back there. But it says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. It says, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, we won't spend a ton of time on this, but gird up the loins of your mind means, what does it mean? It means be disciplined with your thoughts. And what you allow to take up space in your mind. Right? Everything should not have free reign in a Christian's mind. Our heart shouldn't be open to everything. Child of God, every one of you are a landlord. You need to evict everything contrary to that which is godly, everything contrary to that which is holy, everything contrary to that which is right and good in your mind and in your heart and in your life. You need to evict that stuff and gird up the loins of your mind and stop letting the enemy, stop letting the devil rule and reign in your life and wreak havoc on you. Gird up, Gertie. Gird up the loins of your mind. Don't give place to the devil or to anyone or anything that could allow you to compromise truth. You don't want to compromise your convictions. You don't want to give up your victory. Uh-uh. Man, we've been there before, right? Prior to giving our lives to Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't want that old life back. I, I don't want to be ruled by my flesh anymore. No, my friend, I want to do what's godly. I want to do what's holy and right and good. I want the devil to know, amen, that he no longer has control. He doesn't have permission. Matter of fact, I am taking a stand, and I'm not going to compromise anymore. I am going to be faithful, devoted, and true to God. Well, and then it, then it says to be sober. This means to stay in control. Stay in control of all that God has given to you. Your mind, your will, your emotions. That's what mankind is made of. Mind, will, and emotions. Stay in control of them. Stay in control of what's in your home. Stay in control of what you allow in your home and, 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 and the private time of your life. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. We want, we want the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, amen, to shine in our lives, to shine in our car, amen, to shine in our homes, wherever we might be. We want God to get the glory because we're sober. I'm sober. I'm in control. It's a kind of an oxymoron. An out of control Christian. It's ridiculous. It's crazy, right? An out of control Christian doesn't give glory to God. An out of control Christian isn't a good witness. An out of con- no, we are to be in control, not to be given over to indulgences or extravagance. The things that feed the flesh and starve the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. I said this last week, what is sin? What is sin? Now you know that I teach this, that every, every, every sin can be found under three categories of evil. The Bible says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every single sin that you and I could commit will be found under one of the three categories of evil. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Amen. 
We don't want to. We don't want to be a person of sin because sin destroys, sin kills. But giving over to the Spirit of God is life, right? The Bible says that that's why I say salvation is a person because Jesus said, I am the truth, the life, and the way. No one can be saved unless you go through Jesus Christ. Jesus, amen, is the door to the sheepfold, amen. You've got to know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Sin is anything that takes you and I away from doing the will of God. Anything that takes... Now, again, I said this last week. <laughs> having fun is not a sin. Going on vacation is not a sin. I'm talking about spiritual things, okay? So if you're at a birthday party, you know, and, and there's a time for everything. Ecclesiastes says that, you know. Now, there's not a time to sin, you know, I mean, that's ridiculous, you know. Your flesh says it's a time to sin, you know. No, but the, the Bible says don't give place to the devil. The Bible says sin is of the devil, amen. And so we don't want to give place to the devil. We don't want to give place to this flesh, even though we're in the world, but we're not of the world. It's okay. God wants you to have a smile on your face. He wants you to enjoy, amen, this life while you're here. But every moment while we're enjoying it, we need to give and bring glory to God. Amen. And you can do that having fun. Amen. That's why he put spots on animals and stripes on fish. And he made trees and waterfalls. And he made the woman. You know? I mean, there's nothing attractive about a man. <laughs> They're disgusting. Okay, let's get back to this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, be sober, and hope, it says, to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about hope. You and I must, you and I must always possess a confident expectation. So let me say something. I'm gonna, there's no way you're going to have that you and I will have a confident expectation if we're not in control. No. <laughs> the devil is a bottom dweller. He's a stinking sucker. Right? He's a carp. He's a bottom dweller. He's a catfish. No, oh, no, I'm just, you know, he's a... Whatever we were talking the other day, and we were talking about how that, sur that, that submarine, that little submersible, went down, you know, the 12, 13,000 feet to see the Titanic. And, you know, John Larabelle, I just like talking to John because John is filled with so much, you know, he's filled with so much knowledge. And this just came to my mind. We were talking about how what's down there at the depths of the ocean. And John says, you know, the bottom of the ocean is just like a bunch of like jelly. It's just like a bunch of real, like a bunch of dead fish. Just, I don't, he, I don't know if he's here, but I mean, he just said a lot of that, you know, and I got to thinking, wow, think about that. You know, what's at the bottom of the ocean, you know, but again, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but I just wanted to share with you. John and I's conversation, uh, you know. But the deal is, is the, the devil's a bottom dweller. What does that mean? He's going to go right after your faith. What's, what's the foundation of what? What is the foundation of a Christian? It's your faith in God. What's your foundation as a Christian? It's the, it's the word of God. Amen. The devil, amen, is going to go right after your foundation. He is going to chisel away at your foundation. Amen. I, I remember being in a, in, in a service one time where Brother John Putnam was preaching. He was telling a story about this huge skyscraper that was huge. And, and he was telling a story about how there was a man, a janitor that worked there that wanted to build a garage. He was wanting to build this, this garage at home and he had no money to do it. And, and no one ever went down to the 
the basement of this huge, huge building. And, and be- believe it or not, lo and behold, this janitor was chiseling away and he was taking blocks. He was, he was dismantling that building and taking blocks out with him. He worked there for years. I don't know how many years, but they said he worked there and pe- peeled away so many layers of that foundation that the building began to crack the, and, and it began to tilt and, and almost fall over. And they went down to find find out this man had taken enough bricks to build a garage. It's crazy, isn't it? We got to possess a hope. You and I must always possess a confident expectation, a faith in God, a faith in the things of God, and that God will do what, that God will do what he said he would do. Right? Amen. God, I, I want to believe that, that you're a God of your word, that you will do what you, that you said you would do. And we must work diligently to keep our faith strong by staying close to God. You can't keep your faith strong if you get too far ahead of God or too far behind God. You better walk step for step with God. Don't get too far ahead of him and too far behind him. You've got to work diligently to keep your faith strong by staying close to God. You've got to stay strong to, close to his word, close to the house of God, and the man of God. Hey, I didn't make that up. That's in the Bible. That's all in the Bible. They're all in Scripture. Amen. For you and I, amen, to give heed to the Word of God. you got to guard your... Some of you right now, you you, you may not be be in agreement with what I'm saying. Well, you got to gird up your mind. You don't have control over your mind. You're not in control. When the devil enters into your mind, when doubt enters your mind, you got to gird up the loins of your mind. you got to kick the devil out. you got to kick him out right now. We all must stay humble and teachable so that we do not give place to the devil. We keep this hope, the Bible says, until the end. It's an everyday hope. And every day, it's an everyday expectation of one day you and I being able to see Jesus face to face. To one day receive our heavenly reward. Right? It says in the hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have the revelation of salvation. But one day the Bible says that Jesus is going to split that eastern sky, right? He is going to come home for those of us that are looking for his return. Those of us that have dedicated our lives to him. Amen. It, we're not going to be taken unawares. Amen. The Bible declares that we're going to be looking for his return. Amen. Let's move on to verse 14. See, the clock's not saying anything to me. 1 Peter 1 and verse 14, it says, well, it doesn't say anything. You have to read it. It says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. We're not going to get through this. Entirely. It says, as obedient children. Now, look, I did not come here intentionally to offend anyone. Okay? But, but you might, some of you might get offended. I don't, I, I mean, you might. I don't know. But I'm just going to preach the word of God, Okay? It says, as obedient children. I have in my notes, wait, 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 wait. This cannot be talking to me, right? I have it right there, you know. It says it right, wait, 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 wait. You know, this cannot be talking to me, right? This isn't addressing, it's not, a, it's not addressed to you, is it? Right? We're not children, are we? I'm a grown adult. We're adults, right? Well, notice. Notice exactly what the scripture says. As 
obedient children. Now, this is where this is where some of you, I'm not pointing anyone out, but some of us could be could get uncomfortable, you know. Um I put this in my notes that this here, what I'm about to talk about, is the greatest tragedy of 21st century Christianity. It's the greatest tragedy of 21st century Christianity. What is that? What is it? To become a Christian. To say you're a Christian and you're unchanged. Or, let me say it this way, you know, you go to church and you know there's things that, you, that God asks of you to do. So you repent, you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then you think you've arrived, that you've done everything that you're supposed to do, and so you can sit back and relax. Well, that's a lie from the enemy, okay? That is a lie. That, that, that is the last thing, amen, that you need to, that you need to, to, to think about, Okay? So the tragedy of, of Christianity is Christians want to be Christian, but they still want to do whatever they want to do. They still want to live how they want to live. Too many appease their true intentions by just attending church or carrying their Bible or whatever. I mean, fill in the blanks, right? Right? Too many so-called Christians appease their true intentions by doing something, but yet they have not changed their overall behavior. Now, I'm going to say, the Bible does say repent. The Bible does say baptize in Jesus' name by immersion. The Bible does say be filled with the Holy Spirit. With the Spirit. And it does say to be holy. So how are we, what's the standard of holiness? It's me. Right here. This is it, right here. Are you kidding me? <laughs> right? That's disgusting. Who's the standard of holiness? That's right. The Lord. The Lord is. Which we're going to get to those verses, not tonight, but another time. Right? Right? The Bible does say to be holy. To be holy as I am holy. He sets the standard of holiness. Right? Not, not, now, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? I mean, basically, he said, I'm going to live a life unto Jesus Christ, and, and you need to live a life unto Jesus Christ and follow me, because I, I'm going to be, I'm going to do my very best to be the best example to you. Right? But, but Paul isn't the standard of holiness. God is the standard of holiness, right? So that's the tragedy of the 21st century Christian is that they call themselves a Christian, but yet they're unchanged, that, that they still want to do what they want to do. 2 Timothy 3.5 says, 2 Timothy 3.5 says, having... They didn't have this verse. I threw this in there afterward. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. If you see, if you see that, run. I was praying, God, help me understand what this could mean. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And then I get that last part. From such, turn away. D don't, don't even look at that person. Don't even, don't, even, don't even give them a time of day. I mean, we're going to either take the Bible literally or we're not. Okay, so what does it mean? Have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. This is what it means. Not really being godly just having a form of it it's kind of like it but not 
It's only a form because there's no power. It's only a form because there's been no change. It's only a form because there's no results. It's only a form because there's no fruit. Didn't break, did it? Okay, good. It says, having a form of godliness. Not really being godly, but it's just a form of it. You know, it's not the real thing. Right? It's kind of like it, but it's, it's not really. Why? Because there's been no change. There's been no, there's been no spiritual godly results. There's no fruit. There's a little resemblance, but there's no substance. Why do you think Why do you think the unchurched, everybody say the word unchurched. Why do you think the unchurched want to stay unchurched? Because too often there's little difference between them and us. It's true. This is good teaching. This is making all of us think about our life. It should. I don't want to just have a form of godliness, right? I want the power of God at work in my life, right? Now, I just said that why too often does the unchurched not want to go to church? Well, because Christians, that's the tragedy of Christianity, is that there's a lot of people that say they're Christian, but they don't talk any different than the unchurched. They don't act any different than the unchurched. They don't respond any different to the, than the unchurched. Right? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance, long-suffering. Now, hey, we're all a work in progress. I, I stand on what I said tonight. There's no perfect person. The whole deal is, though, is that if you're a Christian, you should be going in that direction. That should be your priority. That in, in, and if you let somebody down, you need to find a place to pray and ask God to forgive you and then go tell that person that you're sorry for not being a good Christian. we got to turn this around. We do. We really need to turn this around. And just because, and just because, you know that, now again, I'm not talking to everybody in here. I may not be talking to anyone in here. But I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling it like it is. I'm telling you, with Christianity overall, matter of fact, let me say that different. I'm talking to everybody in here. And I'm talking to myself as well. Amen. Amen. I, I, don't, I, want, I don't want a form of godliness. I want godliness in my life. Amen. I want to do whatever it takes to get close to God. Amen. And I want to get closer to God tomorrow. I want to even be more closer to God next week. But it's all up to me. It's already 8 o'clock. The phrase, obedient children. Okay, we're getting back. The phrase, obedient children, means children of obedience. Let that sink in. What's the tragedy of Christianity? Is that we become a Christian, but we don't obey. We become a Christian, and we still want to live according to our flesh. That we don't say no to our flesh. I'm pro I can prove it. Okay? I will prove this tonight. The phrase obedient children means children of obedience, meaning the true believers are to be so obedient to God, so obedient to his word, that obedience becomes the basic trait of their lives. Do you hear me? That obedience becomes the trait 
of their lives. Did I make this up? It says obedient children. What is obedient children? It's children of obedience. It's that you and I have, we have such a reverence for God. We have such an awe and a respect for God that when God tells me to do something, I do it. If God's word says it, I should do it. I should obey it. Why? Because I'm a children and a child of obedience. He says children of obedience. Right? The only, the only reason why you wouldn't agree with this is you're living in your flesh. And there's things you still want to do that doesn't honor God, that doesn't honor God's word, that doesn't please God. That's the only way somebody could disagree with me. That you're not, maybe you're not willing, or maybe you're not ready. And that's, and that, and that's okay. Nobody, God's a gentleman. He's not going to force you. He's a gentleman. You know, I'm not going to force you. I'm going to get behind the pulpit, and I'm going to preach to you the word of God. I'm going to tell you that if you want to be a Christian, I'm going to tell you if you want to be Christ-like, then that means you are a child of obedience. A child of obedience does what the word of God tells him to do. A child of obedience doesn't talk against their brother and sister. A child of obedience doesn't swear. A child of obedience doesn't talk against their pastor. And fill in the blank. To know to do good and, and you don't do it, the Bible says it's sin to you. If you're a child of obedience, you're going to be loyal. If you're a child of obedience, you're going to be faithful. If you're a child of obedience, you're going to bridle your tongue. Right? Obedience is to be so characteristic of our lives that we are called children of obedience. Think about it. Think about it. If somebody says they're a Christian, that should mean the very same thing. They're a child of obedience. They obey God. They follow the teachings of Jesus. Right? I know this is kind of tough for us to, to swallow sometimes, but it's true. It's true. And so every one of us could, every one of us can do better. Obedience, I'm going to say it again, is to be so characteristic of a Christian that instead of us being Christian, we could be called children of obedience. This means that you and I are children. I'm trying to break it down. That's what preaching is. That's what teaching is. I'm trying to break it down so we can kind of understand. This means that you and I are children to a specific father. Right? Our heavenly father. Now, we have an earthly father, right? Some of us had, had good earthly fathers. Some of us not so good. And so those of us that had not so good earthly fathers, God can take the place. He can be that example of what a good, a good father is supposed to be. Amen. But this means that if we're called Christian, then we're called obedient children. Then we're called children of obedience. This means that we have a specific father that's our father. And obedient, we will obe be obedient to a specific word. We, be, we will be obedient to a specific word or law or way that the children are supposed to be doing. Make sense? It does. A Christian is a child of obedience. We are to obey God's word. We are to obey God's word and the spirit of God and the leading of God. The Bible says those that are the children of God are those that walk in the spirit. The sons and the daughters of God that walk in the spirit. Now, nobody's perfect. And we, we will be long-suffering. When you are struggling in your flesh, we are going to be long-suffering. We're going to be caring and kind to you. But there also comes a time where we need to, you need to be discipled. Somebody needs to get alongside of you and say, hey, you, you, you need to straighten up. You, you need to fly right. 
You, you know, you have a choice here, right? The Bible says everything should be done in decency and in order, right? People need to be, they need to be expected to be children of obedience. We are to love God's word so much and not put our own spin on it. Have you noticed that, have you noticed that some Christians can just about justify whatever they want to do? They're not obedient children. If the word of God says not to do it, you're not supposed to do it. If the word of God says you're supposed to do it, you should be doing it. This is simple teaching. I don't even think, I don't even think this, is, this is offensive. I'm just, I'm just teaching the word of God. <laughs> it's be mad at me. Okay. I mean, we are to love God's word so much and not put our own spin on it to get our way. But that we simply submit to it wholeheartedly and obey it because we are the obedient children of God. I saw this statement this week. It says, David defeated Goliath, but lost to Bathsheba. Our real giants are the desires we haven't killed yet. I'm going to read it again. David defeated Goliath, but he lost to Bathsheba. Our real giants are the desires that you and I haven't killed yet. What, what, what am I, how does that apply? Well, people, many people call themselves Christians, but stab their brother in the back. You can't do that. You're not a child of obedience. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you cut it. Doesn't matter how you phrase it or whatever you want, however you want to do it. You can't. What it doesn't matter. You put lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You don't. You and I. I'm trying to get this cross to the church. You and I don't get to do what we want to do and be a Christian. If you want to do what you want to do, be the unchurched and live for the kingdom of the devil. You gotta, you, you, you gotta, you gotta be obedient in all things. We cannot be called the children of God and not obey God. Obedient children of God obey even when, even when we don't agree with it or like it. Otherwise, we are no longer obedient. My dad used to say, "There's a difference between obedience and submission." Obedience is actual doing what your sub submission is doing it with the right attitude. You can be obedient and not submissive. Fine, fine, I'll do it. Fine, then. <laughs> I'll go clean my room. You know, the attitude. It's already 8.11. I'm going to hurry on. So 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Okay? There is to be a total change from what we used to do before our conversation and our outright commitment and dedication to God and to his word. So prior to being an obedient child, you and I were fashioned according to the former lifestyle that we had, right? For, the Bible says the former lusts. As stated, it says former lusts. That is, we used to be given over to our own lusts, our own desires, our own ways, our own things, we, the way that we saw it, that we could be called. So if o obedient children are children of obedience, being fashioned in your former lust, then you would basically, if you kind of follow, then you'd be called the children of lust or children of desire. 
This is exactly what a person without Jesus Christ is. He is a child of desire. A person who lives just how he or she wants to live. He or she does what they want to do instead of what God wants them to do. They obey themselves. They obey themselves. Think about that. They obey themselves, their own desires. They, they live for their own desires. They live for their own ways. Not God's way and not his word. I'm coming to a close. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, you have this one. Ephesians 2. I'll, I'll read this scripture and, and then we'll wrap it up. Ephesians chapter 2, 2 says, Wherein, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. If this doesn't prove what I'm talking about. So in times past, prior to being children of obedience, right? You walked according to the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience what what work does a child of a disobedience do among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and not just the flesh of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others you see this scripture declares that this kind of living and this kind of lifestyle was the way we did it in times past. But now we can't live that way and be the children of obedience. We can't live that way and follow God's principles. We can't live that way, amen, and, and be Christian. If you're a Christian and you don't know what God expects of you, I'll finish. It's just a couple more paragraphs. If you're a Christian and you don't know what God expects from you, it's not God's fault. You have the word of God in your life. You have a, the written word. The Bible says that God wants no man to perish, but all to come to repentance, right? It's not God's fault if you can't figure it out. His word, his spirit is leading and guiding you. He's help leading and guiding me to do the right thing. We just need to heed to it and choose to obey rather than disobey. You can't stab a brother in the back and say you love Christ. You can't do someone harm and say you're okay with Christ. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't. It's not right. It's sin. I've said it so many times before. You and I are either living for one of two kingdoms. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of this world. We get to choose. We are either advancing God's agenda or we're going to be advancing the God of this world's agenda, and that is Satan, the devil himself. So what do we do? And this is where I'm going to pick up, not next Wednesday, because there's no church, but the Wednesday after that. Okay? What do we do? We have to seek for holiness. That's what the Bible says. We have to have holiness in our life. You can't be holy. You cannot be holy without the work of the Holy Spirit. People that don't have the Holy Ghost that don't go to church, you cannot expect them to be holy. You can exp they can be disciplined. You know where I, you know my, my teaching on that. I've seen a bear at a, at a circus ride, ride a bike. You can discipline yourself, right? I've seen, I've seen seals balance balls on their noses. Just because you're a good person doesn't make you saved, right? You have to stand with me tonight. Stand with me. So we're going to talk about, we're going to get deeper into this. You know, we're going to talk about children of obedience. So us parents that have children. That's what I love about God's word. It's so practical. It is so practical. God doesn't, he doesn't put anything in his word that we can't understand. We want our children to be children of obedience. Right? I mean, we don't, we don't put a gun in our child's hand and say, go out and have fun, man. You know, woo, go out there and just shoot them up, pal. No, we want children of obedience. We, and what, what, do you think, what do you think God wants from us, right? Amen. I, I could, I got another three, four pages to do that. Amen. I want to be a child of obedience, don't you? I don't want to be a, a, a child of disobedience. I don't want to be a child of desire. I don't want to be someone that, that, that is led around by, by my flesh and by the, the, you know, the, the, my mind, you know, I, I want to be controlled. 
I, 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 I want to be, not be ruled by my flesh. I want to be led by the Spirit. Amen? Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for this wonderful evening. I thank you for the teaching of the Word of God. I thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for helping me, God, to help the people understand what your Word says. I pray tonight that, God, that we would have a hunger and a thirst, a desire to be children of righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Sure appreciate all of you. Love every last one of you. God bless you. Amen. You have a great, great evening. We'll see you. Hopefully we'll see you Friday night at the 4th of July celebration. Hey, and remember, we need help on Saturday, the next day, to clean up. Bill and Shanna, uh, the church has invested in helping them buy fireworks, and they don't own that back part of that property. And so if you could come at 11 o'clock on Saturday, I I'm going to be there. I'm going to come at 11 o'clock Saturday, and I'm going to help them clean up. And so if you could come, the more people we have show up at 11 o'clock, the quicker we could get it done. Amen? God bless you. Have a great night. We'll see you Friday night. I desire.